The Age of Cults and Man-Centered Worship Exodus 20 verses 3 to 5 Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. This is the only commandment, that God called himself something unusual. He called himself jealous, God made it clear that he doesn't like it when another person tries to take his place. Look, you must not worship any other god or person, because it is an abomination. God said, He is a jealous God. God called himself jealous. You should not take this commandment lightly. Unfortunately, we, the Christians who are supposed to know this and understand in greater depth, are the ones going against this commandment of God. If you look at some churches today, you will see that people are worshipping the pastors, all in the name of respect. Pastor worship is a real phenomenon. But before I continue this message, I have to make it clear that this is in no way attempting to get you to be hostile towards your pastor. No, no, do not be hostile towards your pastor. Love them. Take care of your pastors. Be a blessing to them. Don't make their life difficult. Don't be a church member that makes the pastor's job difficult. I have to be clear. Love your pastors. They are people who need to be loved. They do the Lord's work but I believe that every true born-again pastor will agree with me here when I say, don't worship pastors. Pastor worship is a real phenomenon. I have seen pastor worship with my own eyes. I am not preaching this message from a place of theory. I am talking from a place of practice. I have seen this happen. I have attended churches where the walls are plastered with pictures of the pastor. The walls of the church are plastered not with Bible verses, but with quotes from the pastor. This may not be happening in your church, and we thank God for that if it's not happening in your church. Glory to God if it's not happening in your church. But just because it is not happening in your church does not mean it does not happen. I have traveled across the world and attended a lot of churches a lot of them, and there are churches that no longer pray in the name of Jesus. They pray in the name of the pastor. And I sometimes look at these pastors and marvel, just the pure lack of the fear of God in their life. I marvel. I marvel at the sheer fact that they don't fear that they are taking glory which does not rightfully belong to them. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Pastor worship is real. This is not unique to churches in Europe or in Africa or in America. I have seen it in churches across the world, and the people that attend these churches become somewhat indoctrinated to a belief that God only belongs to this one specific church or one specific man of God. Allow me to be clear. God is bigger than any one church. God is bigger than any one man. God is the God of all mankind. Not one person has exclusive rights over God. Don't worship a man. Don't exalt a man. I can tell you that Christians are now praying in the name of pastors in some churches. They have relegated the name of Jesus and they mention the name of pastors only. 
They say in the name of that pastor, is this what God wants? Why have we taken Christianity to this level? Why have we allowed the devil to plant evil in the church and now it's growing? I don't know what it is about human beings, but we have a tendency of wanting idols. We have a tendency of putting people on a pedestal. And this is how pastor worship starts. The moment you find yourself adoring a man as opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are heading down a dangerous path. Your faith is rooted in a person at that point, and not the Lord Jesus Christ. In this new generation of megachurches, we are in a time in history that has never been seen before. Pastors can have mega churches and even have hundreds of thousands of people view their content online. That means they have a lot of power and influence. Mega church pastors have a tremendous amount of power. And I have heard an outstanding quote regarding power. This was in reference to politicians, but I think it is applicable to pastors. The quote goes as following. Power attracts the worst of us, and it also corrupts the best of us. Even for pastors who are not mega church pastors, the role of a pastor is an extraordinarily powerful role. You are with people in their highest of highest moments and their lowest of lows. You are with people in their most vulnerable moments. That comes with a lot of power. Let us pray for our pastors. Let us love them but let us never, ever worship them. A church that worships a pastor is moving into turning into a cult. I repeat, a church that worships a pastor is moving into turning into a cult. Pastor worship can be overt, but in my experience, it is mostly subtle. For instance, how does the congregation speak when speaking does the topic always go back to the pastor? Does all church topics revolve around the pastor? How great he is, the things the pastor has done. When your church worships, does the pastor take center stage and behave like a rock star and behave like you have all come to see him? No, we are to focus on Jesus, not a man. If your church centers around a person, I am sorry to say this, and this may hurt, but it is in the early stages of becoming a cult. Jesus is to be exalted. Everything is to revolve around King Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly says in Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11 that, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. King Jesus, King Jesus, King Jesus. I want us to digest these verses of the Bible. I want us to know and take it in as it is. God has exalted the name of Jesus above every other name. It doesn't matter how powerful your pastor is. It doesn't matter the number of souls your pastor has won for Christ. We thank God for that. I don't want to know who your pastors are. The name of your pastor is lower than the name of Jesus because God exalted the name of Jesus above every other name that has existed and will ever exist. If you are worshipping your pastors, it means you are trying to dethrone God the Father and Jesus the Son. And I know every church leader will agree with me here. It is all about Jesus. We should worship God. Worshipping a person is idolatry. Now, tell me, people, who does this? Where will they end? The Bible tells us this clearly in Revelation 20 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, 
and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Idolatry has no place in the kingdom of God. There is a special place in the lake of fire for idolaters. Don't worship men. Even angels know not to take the glory of God. Revelation 22 verses 8 to 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. If you are removing Christ, and you are worshipping a person or praying in the name of that person, you are setting yourself up for trouble. Satan wanted to exalt himself above God, and he fell as a result. Satan decided that the next thing to do in his life was to dethrone God and become like God. But he fell. That is not the end of that. The angels that followed Satan were not saved. They were not spared in any way. It was Satan who decided to rebel against God. It was him who decided to dethrone God, but those angels that followed him were also removed from heaven. John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I want us to think about Jesus alone. I want us to look at Jesus alone. You need to desire to know God alone. You need to understand who God is. You need to focus on Christ, because He is the only one God has exalted above every other name. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, KJV. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. We all have things we have done in the past that we are not proud of. I will be honest, and I will be the first to hold my hand up. I have done things that I am not proud of. I have done things that I regret. I have had habits that I am ashamed of. There are things in my own life that I have done that I wish I could forget. And I am sure that you can relate to this. If you look at your own life, I am sure there are things which you have done that you do not want the world to know about. And if the truth be told, there are some things we are still struggling with today. There are things that we are still crying and struggling with. Now one problem we have that is creeping into the church is the New Age belief that you are enough to save yourself, that in your own power you can overcome sin, that you are a little God and that you can conquer sin on your own. There is a teaching that is going around the church, which sort of builds up people to attempt to be their own savior. This is completely contrary to the Word of God. The Word of God tells us time and time again that we are not self-sufficient. We need God. John 15, 4 through 6. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. To overcome that sin, you need God. To find your purpose in life, you need God. To be complete, you need God. 
Don't allow these self-help books and self-help teachers to infiltrate your mind. This new age teaching teaches that we humans fundamentally are good in nature and pure and that we need to do a few things for us to get there. Look at what the Bible says, the works of the flesh are that natural state of humanity. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is what the Bible refers to as the nature of mankind. We are all born into the flesh, and our flesh manifest according to that is spoken of in Galatians. My friends, run from this New Age teaching. You are not enough. You are not self-sufficient. You are not able to overcome that sin by yourself. And even if you are able to overcome that sin by yourself, you are only replacing it with the dark spirit of self-righteousness. That within my own power and own self-control, I overcame this sin. I say this all to get to one point. We need God. Jesus died. He did not faint. He was not in a coma. Jesus literally died. And for three days, he was dead. It is important to be clear that Jesus was not killed. Yes, in the sense he was crucified, but he laid down his life. 1 John 3.16 Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The death, burial, and resurrection is absolutely, positively essential to the preaching of the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection is absolutely, positively essential to being a Christian. You will not find one person in heaven who believes the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross was metaphorical. You will not find one person in heaven who believes the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross was metaphorical. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the very foundation and basis of the Christian faith. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a metaphor, Jesus could not say in Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. To overcome sin, we need God. Give yourself over to him and let him change you. Some people think they can help themselves out of some situations they have been trapped in. They think they will fight their ways out of the traps. When I'm talking about traps, I'm talking of addictions that many people struggle with today. You cannot help yourself out of addictions if you are struggling with one. You cannot get out of it yourself. You need to let God himself change you. You need to humble yourself before the Lord. God will not help you if you are full of pride. Humble yourself and see yourself as what you are, a sinner that needs Jesus. When you see yourself as a sinner, that is when God can help. If you are struggling with addiction or sin of any kind, ask God to change you. He says in his words that he will create in you a new heart. He will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. This is a promise from God to you. This is what God will do for you if you can humble yourself before him and let him change you. There are many aspects of our lifestyle that we need to let go of, but it is hard because they have become part of our daily life. For instance, many people struggle with lust in their minds. They just can't help but lust after the opposite sex. They just can't help it. Once they see the opposite sex, they just start lusting immediately. They hate that this happens to them, but they just can't help it. Maybe for you it is deceit and lies that you struggle with. You know it is bad, but you can't help it. You just lie with ease. You feel no remorse for telling lies to cheat and destroy people's lives. You want to change, but it is hard. 
it is because you are walking in the flesh. Maybe what you are struggling with is anger. You just get angry at the drop of a dime. You live your whole life on the edge. Your family is even scared to interact with you. Your husband or wife has to tiptoe around you because you are a ticking time bomb. You know it is a horrible habit and you want to stop your propensity to get angry quickly, but you cannot stop it. Anger has deprived you of many opportunities or maybe has even ended your marriage and you are feeling terrible about it. This is not something you want for yourself. Maybe you've even attended a series of anger management classes, but none of them have helped. God is here to help you. I may not have stated the sin you are struggling with, but you know yourself what the sin is you struggle with. Do you want God to change you? You have a part to play. There is something important that you need to do if you want God to change you truly, and that is surrendering your life to Christ. Surrendering your life to Christ is simply acknowledging, I can't do this by myself, Lord. I need your help. Maybe you are even born again, but you still want that change in a particular area of your life. The reason is that you are not inviting Jesus to that part of your life. This is the time to invite Jesus to that part. It is time for you to invite Jesus to every area of your life. Don't shut him out of some parts of your life. You need a total change. You need to be a new being. You need to be a brand new being in Christ. The first thing you do is cry out like the psalmist in Psalm 51, 10 through 13, KJV. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. This is the first thing you need to do. David needed a change of heart. He knew that he had failed. He knew his heart had been corrupted by sin, and he cried out that the Lord changes his heart. This is what you should do today. Let God see that you really want him to change you. Let God see that you are serious about the change and you want a new life. Cry out to the Lord for a change of heart. God will listen to you and will change you. 2 Chronicles 7.14 KJV If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God will hear you from heaven when you cry out. Paul says in Galatians 2.20 KJV that, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul became born again. Paul crucified the old self with Christ, and he lived again, but with Christ. He became a changed being. He lived for Christ. He submitted himself to God to be changed through Christ. This is what God is telling every one of us today. He wants to change us, but are we ready to experience the new birth? In the last days, people will pretend to be holy but will be living in sin. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 2 and 5 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. The Bible is explicit about the events that will characterize the end time. The Bible refers to the end time as a perilous time, times of evil and difficulty. The major reason the end time is called perilous times is that the events that will characterize it will not be limited to the world, but the church will also be hit by its waves. 
In 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 4, Paul gives Timothy a long list of sinful behaviors and attitudes that will take over the character and behavior of people. And in verse 5, he highlights something that we can all see happening in the body of Christ today. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It is unfortunate that the church presently has adopted a pick and choose religion. They pick and choose what they want. They treat the word of God as a salad bar. Oh, I will take a bit of faith. Oh, but none of that holiness living. Oh yes, people shouldn't steal. I will obey that. Oh, but fornication is an outdated concept. I won't obey that. Oh yes, tithes and offering I will give to the Lord. Oh, adultery is outdated. God surely can't expect me to be with one person my whole life. He won't mind if I commit adultery. Picky choosy Christianity. God does not negotiate his commandments. These people are Christian in name only. They feel free to be very spiritual, but sense no obligation to be biblical. They choose all of God's blessings and ignore his commands. These people are Christian in name only. They are Christians outwardly and not in reality. They profess Christianity, but their lives do not show it privately. They stand on pulpits and profess Christ, and they live a life that does not reflect the Christ they profess. And this is what the Bible tells us is going to happen to so many people the last day. Unfortunately, many professing Christians are falling into this category, embracing a particular theory of imputed righteousness while rejecting the power of the living Christ to produce the fruit of godly and holy character in their lives. Those who have a form of godliness are those who make an outward display of religion. On the outside, they walk like a Christian, talk like a Christian, they even look like a Christian, but they don't live like one. So I encourage you today not to be like this, but I encourage you to be sold out for Jesus, to make a commitment to follow his laws and his ways, to not only be hearer of the word only, but to be a doer of the word, to put into practice the instructions of the word of God. Refuse to be a person who behind closed doors they live a life of sin, behind closed doors they openly indulge themselves in sin. They present themselves as godly, but it is all for show. They speak of God and live in sin. And they are fine with that arrangement. They make an effort to appear holy on the outside, but they are evil. The false prophets, false pastors, all other agents of Satan that the Bible warned us about fall into this category. They always appear to be holy, but they have rejected the true holiness. They don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They pretend to be called by God, but they are not. And if you look at the landscape of the body of Christ, over the last two years people with big names in the Christian community have been found in private sins. People who have major influence in the Christian community have had allegations against them surface, and those allegations have been proven to be true. This shouldn't shock you, but it should prove as evidence of the validity of the Word of God. The Word of God told us that in the last days these people will be there, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Time and time again the Word of God is being proven right. There is no other book with a level of prophetic accuracy as the Bible. 
The Bible says that in the last days people will have the form of godliness but they will deny the power thereof. They will be ungodly but try to show that they are godly. This is that generation where people stand on stage to preach about holiness whereas they are living in sin. Believers now use suits and ties to represent holiness in this generation. Acts 1 verse 1 says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Jesus didn't teach what he had not done. It was what he did that he taught. But some of the people we have in our generation are not doing what they are teaching. They ask people to do what they have never done or ever will do. They criticize people for the offense they are guilty of. They ask people to fast, but they eat behind the cotton. That anyone has a form of godliness does not mean that they are recognized by God. Jesus said that it is not all who call him Lord who will enter into the kingdom of God. This statement shows that there are people who call Jesus Lord out of pretense. They profess the Lord with their mouths only to deceive fellow humans. But their hearts are far away from God. Such people have the form of godliness but deny the power. They make outward display of religion. They present themselves as godly, but all for the show of it. Well, they can successfully deceive fellow humans, but God knows those who are His. He cannot be mocked. There is no act of hypocrisy that is hidden from him. The heart of everyone is bare before God and the motive behind everything we do will be revealed on the day of judgment. There is a difference between a believer who is struggling with sin and someone who is living and enjoying the sin but making a deliberate effort to portray themselves as holy. So today, my brothers and sisters, I encourage you to live a holy life. On the day of judgment, you will be so glad you did. If you have been one of those people who have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, you can stop today. Live for Christ today. The fear of the Lord is what we need in today's society reverence and awe at the God who watches over you. Another medium by which people deceive themselves in these last days is through the manifestation of gifts. They have accepted preaching the word of God as a proof of holiness. They have the head knowledge of the Bible. They know the Bible inside out. They know the Bible better than you or I, but they remain in their sins, pulling the wool. And instead of them humbling themselves before God and to seek for His mercy for restoration, they will rather cover up their weaknesses with suits and good dresses. This was the exact problem Jesus had with the Pharisees that made him refer to them as hypocrites and whitewashed tombs. They appear to be good outwardly, but they are decayed within. While keeping away from immorality is important in general, Timothy was specifically advised to steer clear of those who claim to follow God, yet denied it through their false actions and teachings. Holiness has been redefined in our day and sin has been polished and presented in a way that is acceptable. Unfortunately, sin is now celebrated on a global scale. Worse still is the fact that the world has crept into the church and sinful practices are now being imbibed. 
It doesn't matter, they would say. In fact, the righteous is almost becoming odd in our societies. They are being ridiculed for their righteousness. However, there is a consolation for those who will choose to pitch their tents with Christ and remain uncompromising. Revelations 22 verse 11 and 12 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. When Jesus returns, he will reward the righteous, but punish the unrighteous.